This is Duke University. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the first Distinguished Speaker Series event of 2015. Thank you, as always, Dean Bolding, for moderating this event. At the end, we're going to open it up for audience questions. My name is Diana Vining, and as a City Year staff and core alum, I am so honored to be able to introduce you to my former boss, Michael Brown, uh, the CEO and co-founder of City Year. I've had the pleasure of hearing Michael speak several times before, and each time I walk away inspired and having learned something new. Michael is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, where he served as the editor on the Harvard Law Review. He started his career in public service early by taking his own service year as a legislative assistant to then Congressman Leon Panetta. Inspired by the idea of young people committing a year to service, Michael co-founded City Year in 1988 with his college roommate, Alan Casey. Their goal was to mobilize idealistic young people to address the nation's most pressing needs and create an environment where the most asked question of a young person would be, where are you going to do your service year? City Year has grown from a small pilot project in Boston to 3,000 core members serving in 26 U.S. communities and two international affiliates. This innovative private-public partnership served as the inspiration for the creation of AmeriCorps, and it brings together teams of young people to keep high-need public school students in school and on track to graduate. For his work in developing City Year and advancing the national service movement, Michael has been awarded the Reebok Human Rights Award and been named one of America's best leaders by US News and World Report and an executive of the year by the nonprofit Times, among many other accolades and honorary degrees. We'd like to thank Michael for getting up very early this morning to get on a plane and come here after being up late last night celebrating the Patriots win. Please join me in welcoming Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Diana. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we, we are uh, especially uh, lucky to have you here, given you had to, to beat the, the blizzard this morning to, to come here, although you may feel a little bit lucky to be here I, now. I am um, delighted to be out of the blizzard I, I just, right now. I just looked at the weather conditions in Boston right now. It says snow blowing, snow, freezing fog, feels like minus 10 degrees. Yeah, so. this is the place to be. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, in fact, I'm staying. <laughs> yes. So um, there, there are many things that, uh, that uh, between our conversation and the questions that, that will be asked from the audience that I think we can cover. But I want to start with this interesting question of how, how is it that you, you got here, given that there, there's some markers of success if you're pursuing a law career, like being the editor of the Harvard Law Review is a pretty significant accomplishment. Um, clerking for uh, Judge Breyer, who you then propelled to join the Supreme <laughs> Court after that clerking, uh, uh, that's again a, a marker of someone who is on the fast track for a very successful law career. So what, what went wrong? What? <laughs> I have often said that um, Becoming a social entrepreneur and going to start City Year was a little bit like running away to join the circus, uh, in the sense that um, it was stepping off a, a sort of a beaten path. Um, and I did have tremendous opportunities uh, going to a great college and law school. But something funny happened on the way to sort of this sort of legal career. Um, I spent a year, as Diana mentioned, and thank you again for that wonderful introduction. I feel the same about you and your service at City Year. I'm so glad you're here and made all these connections. I spent a year working for Leon Panetta when I was 20 years old. I took a year off to do that. And I don't know how many of you ever had this experience where the first time you got exposed to an idea, you knew it would change your life forever. I had this remarkable experience. He had this idea about voluntary national service, about calling on Americans when they're young to give a year or two of service, either in a military setting or in a domestic setting. And think of all the benefits for the country if everybody was doing it, not necessarily in a mandatory way, but it was just the thing that everybody did. And all the benefits that would happen from that year of service, people would be turned into active expert citizens and all the work that would happen for nonprofits and the way in which we could actually even help complete the civil rights movement, frankly, by uniting people of all backgrounds to build civic trust. 
So I was essentially thunderstruck by this idea when I was 20 years old and then went back to college and just couldn't get it out of my mind. And together with my college roommate, we did go on to law school, both of us. He was one year ahead. I sort of sent him as a scout. And then um, the interesting thing is something funny happened in law school. I found out I loved law school. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed working. I was an editor of the Harvard Law Review, not, not the editor. I was one of them. But I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the engagement of ideas. And I realized over time that I had one foot on a very traditional path, which was sort of a law career and frankly some very brass ring things, and one foot on this other path about this vision for a year of service for Americans and would I sort of step off into creating something. Um, I, and it was actually, uh, this is back in the late 80s, um, there was a professor at Sarah Lawrence University named Joseph Campbell, some of you may have heard of. He studied world mythology and he had a series of conversations with Bill Moyers on public television called The Power of Myth. And he studied world mythology and he talked about the hero's journey and how basically you have to go lose yourself to find yourself. And he said, if you follow your bliss, then you'll always have your bliss and your bliss will follow you. And he also said that if you actually want to pursue something in your life that's transcendent, you'll probably have to slay a dragon of some kind. And I think I realized at the time that maybe that traditional path was kind of a dragon because mm. it was just all these wonderful brass rings and these opportunities. And what would I tell my grandmother after Harvard education and a Harvard law school that I'm just going to go step off and try to start this thing with no job opportunity whatsoever. And I finally realized that that really was my passion. Um, and um, it was one of the hardest things to do was to sort of step off and say no to that other path. And then once I did it, it was one of the most calming things ever. And um, together with my college roommate, we decided we would launch this thing called City Year um, to engage young people in service. And that was now, now 26 years ago. So th this is a, a question that, that I'm sure everyone in this audience is going to deal with or has been dealing with in their lives, which is how do, how do you be how can you be sure about, I, I need to make this step or jump off this cliff or, or whatever it may be? And so how, how was it that you felt sure or, or did you just take that leap of faith and say, I'm not sure, but I want to give it a try and let's hope for the best? Well, for me, it was, um, it was a combination of really just thinking deeply about my own personal values uh, things that I've been instilled with, and realizing that I was just had within me this deep, deep vision for what this country really could look like if people like myself, I was young at the time, if we were all called on to give a year of service, and realizing that um, um, there were opportunities because of my education to do some more traditional things, but probably no one is crazy and obsessed with this idea as me and my college roommate, and so if we didn't go do it, who would? Um, and so, and I think part of it, people often say to me, Dean, um, I'm interested in starting something. And I always say, first of all, find a passion that you're so passionate about that nobody can knock you off of it. Because you will get knocked off of it. Because life will do that. So if there's something in you that's really passionate and you can get in touch with that. And I said, the second thing is find a partner. Because the difference between one and two is not one, it's infinity. Because two is a team. And so I had this, my college roommate and my law school roommate, Alan Casey, and we were like constantly talking about this idea of national service. We were boring at parties, okay? We were like, talk about something else all day. It can't be the panacea for everything. And, and by having that other person that shared this passion, and we realized we want to go work on this together. And once you have two, then you could have a conversation that could lead to more people being involved in it, and then it can grow from there. So it's so very interesting because people often think about doing something entrepreneurial, having a startup. They think of that as a solo activity. It's just me. I need to think right. of that great thing. But you really found that having that partner That's right. gave you more leverage in what you were doing. That's what, right. What, what, how did you work well together to kind of take advantage of each other's skills? Oh, it would be a matter of like, you know, just here's an idea and you bounce it off them and that ideas grow. Uh, and also when one person's up, the other person might be down and they can lift each other up. And the ability, it just seemed less daunting 
to start an organization. Um, I mean, we had been in school our entire lives. We hadn't run anything, started anything. And the idea of actually jumping off to try to start an organization and really try to jumpstart a movement around service seemed much more possible with a partner. So here, here you are, two uh, law school graduates. Neither one of you went to business school. And, um, and yet, as you started and built this organization, you hit on the notion that the culture was going to be very, very important. And so how did you, how did you learn that, begin to understand that, that building the culture would be so fundamental? Um, and, and why is it so important to you? So uh, we didn't know this, and it, anyone that's been exposed to city year at all, um, it, you find very quickly that we have this kind of very strong culture. We do calisthenics, we do call and response, we recite quotes. It's, um, it's a little corny at times, but I always say it works. And what we realized is that when we were uniting young people of all backgrounds, what we really needed to do was to find a culture that was usable for everybody that could really work and, frankly, make it a culture that would promote idealism. Because it's hard to maintain your idealism. It's hard to maintain this idea that change is possible. But if you could create a culture where everybody was feeling it all of the time. So for example, when we were first starting Sidier, we said Sidier came down to two quotes. One was a Native American prayer that says, Great Spirit, grant that I won't criticize, criticize my brother or sister till I've walked a mile in his or her moccasins. And that's about empathy. And the second quote was from Robert Kennedy when he went to South Africa at the height of apartheid. And he said that every time a man, and I will add a woman, stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends out a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples crossing each other through a million different centers of, it, of energy and daring create a mighty current which can wipe away even the highest walls of oppression and resistance. So that's about courage and singular acts creating something large. So we basically said, City is all about empathy and courage. If you have empathy and courage, you can change the world, and we want to create an institutional framework for it. Now, we didn't know that that would turn into a whole set of quotes, a whole set of ideas, and we began sharing them, and we began finding them everywhere. And for example, we even put them into our institution. So when we have a meeting at City, or I don't care if it's on a budget and we've got a real tough issue coming up, Roman numeral number one is always, is always what? sharing ripples based on this quote. So basically, before we start any meeting, we want to hear what's happening out there that's powerful and positive based on acts of courage and belief. Are students being helped? Has there been a great grant that somebody said, I really believe in this organization? And that puts everybody in a good mood. And I always say that if, if someone's withholding a ripple from me, they're withholding my inspiration. And therefore, I can't inspire others because inspiration is something we have to share with each other. So the culture is incredibly important. And if you really want to change the world, you have to have resilience, because the world will knock you down. And you have to find ways to build it directly into your culture. And frankly, I found that's in a lot of businesses. Businesses get tossed problems all the time. Many of you have had work experiences where one day there's a huge crisis, and people just don't wring their hands. They roll up their sleeves. And so I really think that uh, business has a lot to teach with regards to having an optimistic, can-do, problem-solving approach. So your idealism is at the core of, uh, of City Year, and I think the core of your being. Um, and you, you have all these sayings, putting idealism to work. How many of them do you have now? There's about 108 sayings. We have this little book, it's called PITW, Putting Idealism to Work. And we just began to write down little things um, like, um, they're aphorisms, like, this is hard, be strong. And we would repeat them, and they would have a lot of effect over time. <clears throat> and um, what we realized is that you can create an entire culture around these little insights. Um, and they are, um, we've also realized is that idealism is not necessarily pure optimism or being naive. Idealism is actually um, something that can be learned and it's a way of approaching the world, about f looking at the world as it is, uh, imagining um, a different outcome, and taking very concrete steps to, to achieve that. That's essentially called a business plan, folks, right? 
And you can, if you marry that with certain values and resilience, you can provide an incredible framework for acting on your idealism. Yeah. So you love idealism. How do you feel about cynicism? <laughs> well, the number one, we have um, <clears throat> these, these PITWs, as I mentioned, the number one, they're, they're numbered, and number one is to, um, to fight cynicism wherever you find it, especially in city air. Because it's essential, cynicism is corrosive. It basically is a downbeat in our lives that says that that things aren't possible or questions everyone's motive. Um, and that drives people away from being full of goodwill and actually putting themselves forward in ways that make themselves vulnerable that you need to be able to do to affect positive change. Mm -hmm. So that's why cynicism isn't just something that's sort of, eh, it's not a, a, a bad thing. It's really the enemy of, of the common good. Yeah. You talked about how the, the, the idealism that you feel, that, that you felt that connected to the 60s and a sense of real optimism and idealism during that time, and that part of what drove you to, to create City Year is a, is a concern that, that that idealism would go away. Are you, winning, are you winning the war? Do you feel like that idealism as you look at the people coming out of colleges today, is it back? in a way that, that makes you feel better? I think there's just an, <clears throat> a natural idealism uh, in young people. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I've always thought that. I think there are cyclical ways in which our society supports or doesn't support it, and where it sort of allows it to its full fruition or basically sort of pushes it away. And that's why I've come to the conclusion that if there were a space, a year of service that sort of everybody was doing, it would provide that institutional framework that would basically say, you can work on the issues of the day, you won't lose your place in society. In fact, it's not a gap year, we call it a leap year. It's a year of actually getting to know your society in ways that can turn on your justice nerve, your citizenship nerve, and provide life skills that can be transformative and can even take you in all kinds of other directions. And so in that sense, what I'm most interested in is an institutional framework for saying yes to the idealism that I think is naturally in all people, mm -hmm. especially when we're young. Mm -hmm. When Diana introduced you, she, she noted a lot of awards that you've won for being the, the best this, the best that, the best CEO, and what, what is it? So clearly, the data suggests that, <coughs> that you are a great leader. You can't deny it. I mean, the evidence is clear. So what, what do you think you're doing that makes you so effective as a leader? Well, let me just parry that authentically, if I can, for a minute, and then try to answer some of what I think you're looking for. Is We do live in a society where if an institution succeeds, um, they look for one person and say, well, who did that? We just do. I mean, you just, you know, you're, the cases that you're studying. And the environment that you're all in, you work in teams, you work in groups, you've all worked. Um, and you know that there's no great thing that's ever done that isn't done by a team. So that, that's just the way our society looks at things. Um, uh, and, and that can get in the way, frankly, of actually acknowledging the power of teams as a society. I do think, um, I think my leadership style personally has changed over the years. I think in the very beginning I was kind of like, okay, the guy that always had to go to the whiteboard in the middle of every meeting and say, I got it, I got it, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this. And I realized over time that we're attracting these enormously talented people. They have incredible ideas and experiences. And then what it's really about is getting those diverse opinions on the table and putting the challenges out there and letting people solve things and getting out of their way. My favorite question, and it's all about asking questions, really. My favorite question to ask in a meeting um, of any manager is if you could wave a magic wand and do this any way you wanted to, how would you do it? Because by the time people come to me with some kind of solution, they're all wrapped up in, maybe they don't even realize it, all the things they think can't happen to get something done. So they've come up with all these workarounds of what we're really trying to do. And when you ask that question, I think it's really freeing for people. Because then my next question is, well, what's in the way of us doing it that way? And that's a whole different conversation. What's helped you learn, develop, and grow as a leader over time? Um, I think experience is probably, you know, you get, you get ups, you get downs, you get knocked down. Um, resilience, I think, is probably among the most important things that a leader can develop, which doesn't mean you get right up back right away, but mm -hmm. you have to learn that there will be a better day, 
and you can come back. Um, getting honest feedback from people who care about you, um, I think that's incredibly important. Having mentors, I've been blessed to have a number of really tremendous mentors who'll be really honest mm -hmm. um, with me. I think all of those things have helped. What, what's challenged you the most? What's been most difficult and, and knocked you back and, and forced you to become more resilient? Oh, um, I think it's when, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think the hardest things are where you feel like you have seen, like I, well, the thing that really inspires me is young people acting on their idealism. Like that's what's kept me here for 26 years. I go into a school and I talk to core members and I always ask the same question, how do you know you're making a difference? And they tell me about the kid who had his head on the desk and the teacher's been teaching for days and the kid with the head on the desk, but the teacher can't stop what she's doing to get this kid the extra supports they need. And they tell me the stories of how they've actually engaged this kid until finally the head's off the desk, now the hand's at the blackboard, the hand's in the air. It's incredibly inspiring the role that young people can play just within city or our idealistic environment, because we work in high need schools. And when you see all that and you get impatient to scale it, to grow it, every time we have to turn away somebody that applies for city or that could be effective in a high need classroom, I just, it, it can make you crazy, right? And then when you can't match up the resources to that or someone turns you down, you have to be careful that you don't get self-righteous, that, you know, but those feelings of seeing something that you know works, which is unlocking youthful idealism. Yeah. So I think those are some of the things of actually seeing, and the fact that um, there were 687,000 people that applied for AmeriCorps in 2011. It's the last time they took the stat, and there were only 80,000 positions. And when you apply for AmeriCorps, and I know there's folks in the room and others that have done AmeriCorps, I mean, you're basically, you know, donating the fair market value of your time to your society by basically for a stipend and a small scholarship and giving your all 12 and 15 hours a day and the fact that we're saying no to that. So I think things that get in the way of, of that, that can be frustrating. And yeah. like I said, you want to make sure that you're, um, you know, you, you just, you still have to handle it in the right way. And every single person still needs to be shown a pathway mm -hmm. for support. Mm -hmm. So you, you are inspired by the people who are at the point of contact in terms of what City Year is trying to accomplish. Are there, are there other uh, leaders of organizations that, or, or leaders in the world generally who you find inspirational? Oh, sure. <clears throat> um, you know, I hope it's not trite to say that, you know, I, I, I remember the day Martin Luther King Jr., you know, when he was killed. I'm part of the generation that was alive when he was alive and was real. So I hope it's not trite to say that Dr. King was just this tremendous influence on my own life and that he combined not only uh, this incredible power to organize and his oratorical powers, but he was actually rooted also in the academy. He, had, he, was, he was synthesizing ideas all the time and then putting them into practice, into his movement. Um, I've been, uh, I was inspired by Stephen Jobs and how he would, could conceive of different ways that human beings could interact with their world in ways that they could become, they could use technology to be sort of more human is sort of this remarkable, um, uh, this remarkable feat. Um, a friend of mine named Brian Stevenson started the Equal Justice Initiative after he left Harvard Law School. He has a new book out called Just Mercy, which I highly recommend. Uh, and his organization is on the forefront of dealing with over-incarceration um, and over um, uh, penalties, uh, death penalties, um, that are used much too often, if at all, they should never be used. Uh, and he's at the forefront of changing our laws before the Supreme Court, and he's a deep source of inspiration mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. Moving to the more operational side, one of the, the, the issues that you can see in a nonprofit organization is there's not a lot of rigor in running the business. There's not a lot of uh, data analysis, for example. Tell me about the role of data analytics and, and um, your, your version of the ABCs and how, right. that, how that unlocked more potential for what right. you could do and then on to assessing the impact of what you're, right. what you're doing. So when we started City Year, the whole idea was to bring together people of all backgrounds for a year of service for a tremendous experience. In fact, I like to say that uh, originally we didn't care so much about what our widgets would be, we cared about our workforce. 
And we said yes to any organization, nonprofit that wanted that service. We said we'll be the yeast in your bread for every nonprofit. We will send you talented young people to actually expand all that work. And that, was, um, that worked very well for many years. And then 10 years ago, we stepped back with a different question, which is how we can have more impact, how we can focus our work. And we found that most of our work was being attracted into high need schools. And what was interesting is Johns Hopkins University came out with a series of studies. And first they found that a million students are dropping out of high school every year. And the reason that's important is not only is that an enormously catastrophic number, but there are 15,000 school districts in America. So even normalizing the data to know that a million students are dropping out of high school was incredibly important. It further found that 12% of the high schools are producing 50% of the dropouts. So just think about that for a minute. Think about 12% of the high schools in America are producing a majority of the dropouts. Most of these schools are the same schools that have been producing more dropouts than graduates for a generation. And most of those schools are in low-income communities of color in urban centers. That is a national crisis. That is a civil rights crisis that basically says your zip code will determine your destiny. Um, and the study finally further found that you can identify who's likely to drop out of high school by early warning indicators. High absences, poor behaviors, and course failure in math and English. So those are our ABCs, absences, behaviors, and course performance. If you have one of those early warning indicators, say you only come four days or less a year to school, and you're in the sixth grade in a high poverty district, you have less than a 20% chance of graduating with your class six years later. But if you can get to the 10th grade on time and on track, you have an 80% chance of graduating, fourfold. If you drop out of high school, it's really a fast track to an underclass in our society. You're three times more likely to be in poor health and to be underemployed, and you're eight times more likely to be incarcerated over the course of your life than if the simple act of actually getting that high school degree you're gonna make a half million dollars less than the cohort that graduates high school, a million dollars less than the cohort that graduates college. And by the year 2018, two-thirds of all jobs in America are gonna require some meaningful post-secondary degree. There's really no room economically in our society if you haven't got at least that high school um, degree. Mm -hmm. So what we've done with that information is we've adopted the early warning indicators absences, behaviors, and course performance as our metric. And amazing folks like Diana here and David that have done our core, each of them did two years in our program, they go into high need schools, they greet students at the schoolhouse steps at 7 or 7.30 in the morning with high fives, knowing them by name, welcoming them to school. By 9 o'clock in the morning, they're calling home of every student who's absent, knowing them by name, talking to their parents, where are you, come in today. Then they're in the classrooms working with focus lists of students on absences, behaviors, and course performance, and they stay throughout the after-school space till six o'clock at night, running an after-school program that's academic and enrichment-based. And it's all metric-based. And you know what? It's also all relationship-based. So it's both. We're all about metrics, and we're all about relationships. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it is about human relationships that are gonna actually make people want to be able to be successful if they believe someone cares about them, if they have these relationships. Mm -hmm. But we've been able to actually put real data into nonprofit management. And we were able, with two other organizations, um, Talent Development Secretary of Johns Hopkins University in communities and schools, win one of those I3 grants that Secretary Duncan put out, a $30 million grant to test our program on a randomized control trial. It's a five-year trial. And this is the fourth year, so I hope to be invited back in a year and be able to say that our program is proven. Uh, and we, have, we really are expecting some very exciting results that can basically show that you can use national service to move the needle on important indicators in American education. As a believer in national service, I think it's something that has to go from what I would say is nice to necessary. Because when I talk about what I, de what I do, most people say that's really nice. It's really nice, Michael, that idea of a youth corps. I like that idea. But only if they think it's necessary to move the needle in society on something important are we ever going to get really large-scale service in the country. And that's what we hope to be about. 
You, you said something um, interesting, which was when you got started, you were really focused on the idea that service, the act of service could change lives and create these ripples that would carry forward in society. And, and in fact, I think the, the original really audacious goal was that when people finished high school, the question they were asking is, how will I serve? Now there's a, there's a transition, which is your a recognition that it's not just that you're serving the people who are serving others, but you're also worried about the people mm -hmm. that you're helping. And I'm curious, has that transition been at all challenging as you think about it, it, that we need, we need to really deliver the goods in terms of make an impact on these lives and, and improve the educational prospects of, uh, of all these students, as well as change lives of people like Diana. How, how does, that, does that ever kind of catch you in unexpected ways? Well, what we found basically is that unless you give young people something really powerful to do, it's not gonna be a great experience for them either in terms of their development. So the fact that you're put in city or into a high need school, highly trained in evidence-based practices, but it's incredibly challenging. It's, 12 and 14 hours a day, that in and of itself, when we also augment it with leadership and other skill development, provides the best um, opportunity. If we were to have a writ large system of national service, the way I look at it is national service would essentially be the operating system, if you will. And then creative people, like yourselves, would be writing the apps and applications for it. So essentially, we've written an application for national service that takes tremendous young people and puts them into high need schools. Other organizations like Teach for America, which I know a number of you have done, that has written an application that takes that youthful idealism and puts them in high need schools as teachers. There's also Youth Build, there's Citizen Schools, there's Jumpstart. What we need actually, I think, is a whole revolutionary approach to meeting societal needs that basically allows entrepreneurs to work with governmental and private sector resources to utilize this tremendous talent of the American citizenry to meet these problems that are both high impact and low cost. Mm -hmm. There's a saying, no good deed goes unpunished. And uh, you mentioned Teach for America, uh, and we do have a lot of people who come to us from having uh, experienced, uh, been a part of that program. And, and they've been getting a lot of complaints about, uh, about what they're doing. Without saying anything about Teach for America, why is it that City Year has not received that same kind of criticism? What have you done to, to avoid that? Well, every organization faces um, criticism. I think Teach for America definitely has a higher profile um, th than, than we do. Um, I do think that we are um, um, basically working within the system um, and basically bringing in young people to try to augment um, evidence-based practices that have been proven uh, to move the needle in, in public education. Um, uh, Wendy Kopp is a friend of mine I, and a hero of mine um, who I've known for 25 years and I think has just been an extraordinary leader. And I tremendously um, honor um, everything TFA uh, has done and achieved. And um, if you had told me when I was at Harvard that a third or more of the class would be competing to work in high need schools and that that would be sort of the brass ring of that experience of coming out of, out of, out of these schools, I would have thought you're crazy. And look what, look what she and TFA um, have done. Mm -hmm. I do think that when you deal with education reform uh, and you put yourself on the cutting edge of it as TFA has done, you will face the brunt of a lot of concerns and criticisms because there's so much cacophony out there with regards to education reform. In fact, you can't go online, you can't read a newspaper, or even have a casual conversation amongst each other, right, and talk about education reform in some way and not find some kind of conflict come up pretty quickly. What I've found, though, is that just below the surface of all of that conflict, almost everybody is agreeing with everybody. And here's what I mean by that. Almost everybody is saying you need to extend the day in high need schools, sending students home at two o'clock in urban communities when their suburban peers have all kinds of resources to go till six o'clock at night on weekends, whether it's violin, music, or math classes. We need to bring those same kind of resources to the high need schools. Everyone's agreeing you need one-on-one -on -one and small group instruction. 
for the students who need it the most. Everyone's agreeing that you need social and emotional learning to make sure that students have what they need in their lives that's taken care of so they can actually have some academic support. Um, everyone uh, is agreeing that you need data walls, not necessarily high stakes testing, but assessments as to where students are at and early warning indicator systems and response intervention programs and attendance initiatives. You just go online, just, everyone's agreeing. So what are they arguing about? They're arguing about who's going to pay for it and who's going to control it. And those are very big issues in our society. I understand it in terms of, um, of those issues. What we're seeing is that while those issues are being played out, national service, young people who are largely donating the fair market value of their time can come in at relatively low cost and high impact and they can extend the day in high need schools mm -hmm. and they can provide a one-on-one -on -one and small group instruction and put up the data walls and run the attendance initiatives, all programs that have been proven. So what we're seeing is that national service really could be part of a bipartisan solution for a government that maybe is closer to the ground but still highly at scale, um, using people power to drive those solutions. I'm gonna ask one more question and then turn it over to the audience so you can start thinking. Um, so the, uh, one of the things about an entrepreneur is that oftentimes what you'll see is you, you start an organization and you're the, the founder is the right person in the early days and, and then as the organization becomes bigger that, that that person loses interest because all of a sudden, instead of just focusing on that big idea, you're, you're running a big organization. And in your case, you're running a much bigger organization and you are, you are constantly having to work on the corporate partnerships, the government partnerships, the school district partnerships, um, and, and so on that, that make this a viable organization at a bigger scale and you have ambitions to, to grow the scale even, even more. So how have, you, how have you kept yourself engaged as the, the things that you have to do have evolved over time and been able to keep your relevance? Uh, that's a good question. And um, I can tell it sort of from my own experience and whether or not I am still relevant, I guess it's sort of up to others. But in terms of me, what's so interesting is I started um, going to the national service field because of a policy uh, opportunity. I went to Capitol Hill. I got inspired by a big idea from a policy perspective. And when we started City Year, it was never really just about City Year. It was always about that idea of one day that most commonly asked question of a young person could be, where will you do your service year? What I didn't know then was that I actually would enjoy building an institution. I would enjoy working on organizational development and I would enjoy working on the kinds of systems that it would take and I would enjoy building its culture and these other aspects. And I do think that if you're a leader of an organization, it, you need to be very, as much as you can, self-aware about what you enjoy and what you think you can be good at. So what your passion points are and what your skills are and also where your organization is at. What stage is it at? And does your passion and your skills match up to that stage? And if not, how could it, or is it maybe time to not be there? And in the beginning, I really enjoyed the entrepreneurial stage of the startup. A lot of it was communication and sharing a vision. And then, as I said, I really found out that I, I liked the idea of actually institutional development. How do you build systems? How do you recruit? How do you build um, the ability to have programmatic solutions to things uh, and build a culture? And then, when we had this opportunity to focus in high-need schools, with this data-driven approach, I realized that it really excited me most of all. And I, perhaps after 26 years, I'm maybe more excited than ever. I still think you need to be self-aware and maybe someone will tap me on the shoulder at some point and say, you may be excited and think you're doing a good job, but you know, it's time to move on, Michael. But for now, for at least where the organization has been at, it's always, almost always been a new organization every five to seven years. Mm -hmm. And that's been just an incredible privilege to work on. Yeah. Okay, let me turn it over to the audience. Yeah. Uh, oh, there are microphones oh. being distributed. We'll go there next. Um, you emphasized in the beginning the importance of having the right co-founder when founding your own company. Um, the problem that I see is often that the co-founder you really match with and who has the same passion as you often has similar skills to yourself and doesn't really complement my own skills. 
So how was it in your case, and what do you see more important? Um, having the same, having a co-founder who really matches my personality, I get along with very well, or someone who like has skills which complement my own skills, but is probably not matched with me as well as someone who's more similar to myself? I, well, first of all, no two people are ever the same. So everybody does approach something differently. I think for us, for Alan and I, first of all, we were friends first. We were actually, we were assigned to be roommates on the first day at college. And we stayed roommates all the way through college and law school until literally the day I got married. <laughs> <laughs> literally. And it was, we were in a two bedroom apartment and he realized, well, he didn't want to have to pay for a two bedroom and we would take a two bedroom. So he was packing up while he was writing his best man speech. Okay, for, and so I guess the most important thing about finding a partner is, the most important thing is it's a friend. It's somebody who, you, who cares about you and you care about them, and then you go off on this journey together, and then you find out sort of what you're bringing to it. And um, I would um, have certain passion points about maximizing City Year as an organization, I think, and Alan was even more into the policy aspects of it, um, and his things were more about leveraging the organization from a, from a standpoint for national policy. And I actually think that ended up working out really well, and it wasn't like he only did that and I only did this. It, these things are more nuanced than that, but I think the bottom line is if you do find a partner for something, if it can be based first and foremost in friendship and in mutual respect, I think, um, that's probably the most, the most important basis for it. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for being here today My and pleasure. for coming from Boston. Um, so I've, City Year is something that I really support and believe in. Um, public service runs in my family. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. My sister's an AmeriCorps volunteer. Um, but one of the critiques I've heard about public service, and particularly what you're suggesting, is um, that it implies somewhat of a position of financial privilege, that the people who are in their early 20s and can take a year off and do this detour from what is a prescribed career to really come from well-off families, uh, well-educated, fairly well-to-do, um, and A, they can take time off from a career, and B, they have the financial support to do that. And you actually alluded to that by saying that you're donating the fair market value of your time. So as you envision this world where you transition from public service being not just nice but necessary, how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? Does it imply some type of policy change? Does it imply um, organizational change? Or does it imply something at a societal level? So um, the main thing that when we started to promote this idea of city year and trying to generalize it into something that eventually became AmeriCorps, the most important thing we put out there is that it needed to be stipended. It actually needed to be paid. And the idea, we started City Year with both a stipend and a scholarship as a model for what policy could be, and AmeriCorps did adopt that. Even when we were doing it, there wasn't a real need to do a scholarship, but we actually wanted to demonstrate policy. And um, the reason for that is that we wanted it to be a sacrifice for everybody, but a big enough stipend and scholarship that basically everybody could do it. And there's an argument out there that some people say, oh, I really like what you do on Capitol Hill. They'll say, but we shouldn't be paying volunteers. And I say, we're not paying volunteers. We're providing a stipend so that people can actually give a, a year of service full time and then some, and that all can do it. So our own demographics, over half of our core, has self-identified as Pell Grant eligible themselves when they were going to school. We have a, our core is majority uh, core members of color. We have a tremendously um, diverse core. Uh, and we think that's important. There's, there's always more diversity you want, and we're looking at ways to ensure that every single kind of diversity uh, is there. And we're planting what I call long seeds with our core members, telling them to really help recruit the young people that they're serving in those schools, that they one day could graduate high school and college and put the red jacket on and come back into their own communities. And many of our core members are serving in those communities. So I, well, I think it's, it is a, it can be an issue, um, and never, not every organization is as focused on it, but it also isn't a situation where it's always the case. You have to work at it. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, just curious about how you managed to convince your family and your parents when you were 26. It, seems, it seemed to me like the toughest part is because you're not convinced about the idea yourself, 
you, you have the passion, but when they ask these difficult, tough questions, it could be your parents or it could be your partner or whoever it is, it's so hard to convince them. How did you manage to do that? To convince someone in your family to go do something like this? Yeah. Oh. I, I was blessed in having a, a family that was pretty, um, um, you know, just believed in. My mom always said, you know, you give your kids roots and wings. Um, and, um, you know, my father also really believed in this work. The hardest thing I had to do was, exp in my mind, was explain to my grandmother <laughs> what I was about to go do. His son had gone on to Harvard and Harvard Law School, and I was going to go do these things. Um, ultimately, I found with anything is that what, there's, a, there's a, a, little, a poem that we had come across once from a Scottish um, writer, and there was a line in it that says that once you commit, then providence moves too. And the idea is that if you commit to something, the world will, some, will begin to organize itself around your commitment. But in, and it actually goes on to say, until you commit, until, well, there's hesitancy, all is lost. <laughs> and so this idea that your commitment brings about the commitment of others, and it's true of the core when they come in to the classrooms that the students feel more committed to their own work because someone's committed to them. It's very, commitment's a very powerful thing, and it's something we all have the ability to give. And when we give commitment, it's this enormous power that we have. Um, so my only advice is that if you can't convince people that one way at the end of the day to eventually bring them around, and I've seen it time and again, certainly with core members whose family said, why are you doing that, and other kinds of things, um, that when you commit, that even family commits to. Hi, Mike. Thanks for being here. Uh, my question is, throughout your time leading City Year, uh, what was the time when you have to balance out between um, slowing down and um, to make sure that you maximize the impact versus continue to proceed with whatever the growth that you're planning to do? Um, or to put it lightly, um, when was the time when you feel the need to put your feet on the brake pedal and slow down rather than continue to grow? Thank you. So the, embedded in that question is sort of the issue of growth. Um, and when we started City Year, we started with 50 core members. And then the next year, we wanted to have 75. And there was people that were like, that's crazy. We're going to have a 50% growth. And um, over time, what I realized something that there is an and, and, and people would say, you need to slow down to be able to get it right and then grow. And there is sometimes something like that, but it's nowhere near the calibration that most people think. Because actually, growth gives you permission to get the resources to be able to build something at a reasonable scale where it can actually execute in an excellent way. And until you grow to some certain scale point, that you'll never have the resources to be able to put that in place. So it's actually sort of inverse to the thinking. And I'm not saying always grow. And, but I do find that for our first 10 years, as we grew and were successful and we took risk in it, we did find that then the resources would come to say, we want to be able to help you build the systems to make this not only viable, but sustainable and consistent. We did step back, as I mentioned, 10 years ago. And we were still growing on a general service core and we said we want to take a strategic pause and find out how we can have more impact. And we really went through a very intense period. We did retreats with senior management and boards. We did a lot of introspection. We talked to teachers, principals, our core, and really paused to say, where should we play to have the most impact? And during that two or three year period, that's when we developed our whole school, whole child program. And we didn't grow much during that period. And the year was around 2007, 2008. And guess what was beginning to happen around then with the uh, financial crisis? And the financial crisis began to move in in August of 2008. And I realized that we were going to have to take a million dollars out of our budget that year just to be safe, because I'm, you know, I'm conservative in my own ways. Um, and I said, I want solutions for this. So I sent people out say, come back to me. Draw a, a circle around anything. Protect anything that's about our future and anything that's about our people. And now come back to me with what we're going to do. And what we ended up cutting was our national conference. 
which cost about a million. We used to bring everyone together. It was amazing. Every single core member, every single staff member for almost a week. And it was, we called it syzygy because it's like a celestial lining up of everybody. And people still remember their syzygy days. It was like this incredible idealism. We got big speakers to come like Bill Clinton and John McCain. And it was incredible. But in one stroke, we took out $1 million. And then we kept the resources in the future. And that allowed us to build this whole school, whole child program, which allowed us to ask schools for resources. Until then, schools weren't contributing to our organization. People often ask me, if you could start City Year again, what would you do differently? And I would always say the same thing. I would charge something for our service. In the, begin, in the beginning, we didn't. And if people don't have skin in the game, and you just are here to help, they don't take you as seriously. So with our new platform in place, we asked schools to contribute. And that allowed us to grow. And City Year has nearly tripled in size during the Great Recession, from a core of 1,000 to 3,000, and 50 million to 150 million dollars. And I think it's really about the strategic pause we took to put a stronger impact platform in place. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, so clearly you've had a lot of success, and I was wondering if you could meet your 25-year-old self, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, gosh, don't take yourself so seriously. Oh, would you really wish that on me or anyone to go confront our younger selves? Um, um, to get some perspective, one thing I always tell the core, because I've learned this over the years, I say the first thing we lose is sleep, and the second thing we lose is perspective, and the third thing we lose is gratitude and graciousness in our daily lives. And it just goes like, that's the cycle. You lose sleep, you lose perspective, and you don't treat each other and yourself well. So if I had a chance to go back, I would try to practice what I've learned since then. Sleep more, is that? Sleep a little more. I always say people are on their own. It doesn't work. But perspective, find ways to build perspective, and really express gratitude and graciousness in your daily life instead of um, self-righteousness. I wouldn't want to look at that 25-year-old self all the time. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Hong Yi. I'm from Maryland, not here. Um, thank you so much for giving us a speech today. And uh, my question is, um, I know it's not easy to create a company, and uh, even it's a nonprofit one. Why you choose to create a nonprofit one instead of profit one? And what's the most difficult thing you made in the, um, you know, setting up the business? Because right now uh, I'm helping with a company, a software one, uh, to create a new branch uh, in the University of Maryland uh, Technology Incubator. I know how hard it is to, you know, do with all the operating work. So uh, I bet it's much harder to you know, uh, work with in a non-profit one, because it's hard to convince other people to invest uh, in this industry. So uh, could you give us some ideas? Yeah, I think now all of you, if you want to become social entrepreneurs, I really think in something that um, Case has been talking about so wonderfully, and I also want to say publicly that Greg Dees was a dear friend of mine um, and a leader that helped to define the very idea of social entrepreneurship for the last 25 years. And he's co-founder of Case here, and he's dearly, dearly missed. But his ideas are deeply embedded in this institution, and Case is doing such powerful work. And one of the ideas that's coming out of Case is tri-sector leadership. That is a powerful concept, tri-sector leadership. Leaders of the 21st century need to be able to lead on any given day in the private sector, in the governmental sector, and in the nonprofit sector. And I think your generation is like, you get that and you can operate in that. When we were coming up, it was more like, for this kind of work, I don't think we really thought of it in terms of for-profit side. And remember, we were more about our workforce than our widgets. We weren't yet about delivering a direct service. The only way we could have charged for it, I guess, is to say to wealthier families, you could do a year of service that way. And we wanted to have everybody in it. So it was a nonprofit. And if anything, I think we were innovating on it. Why wasn't it a government program? We were essentially saying, this is an urban peace corps that's privately sponsored. So that, that may have been one of, our, our, of our, uh, our innovations. The hardest thing to do in all that is that you don't have a customer that's paying you here for this. 
you've got a donor that's giving you money so you can go do this. And you have to service the needs of the donor while you actually have to get um, outcome over here. And I've been jealous over the years of the private sector that, where they can put the two together and if they're servicing their company and they can get a price point that can actually deliver a margin, they can build their organization. In the last seven years, we've done that to a degree with school districts because we've asked school districts, as I mentioned, to have skin in the game. And now we're scaling because of it and it feels right that they're putting resources in and we feel like we're really being held accountable to the people in our society that are accountable to the students. So that feels, that feels right. Uh, I want to echo my classmates and say thank you for coming today. I'm Diana's roommate, so I feel nice. very fortunate and uh, have a lot of respect for city year. Thank you. Um, my question is, for those of us who never took the service year or two um, and now know what we're doing post-graduation, what advice do you have for people like me who are 27 and want to do something to have the most impact? Is it getting involved with my community? Is it simply dollar donations? What is it that those of us in the room could do? No, I appreciate that. Um, my main message is that all of your skills, I mean, you are among the most highly credentialed um, young people in the world with this remarkable education you're getting here at Fuqua. And all of your skills are completely transferable into all of these sectors. And you can follow your passion at any time into any of these things. So just that's my first point. Secondly, wherever you land, and every single day, City Year is made possible by amazing leaders in the private sector. And for those of you that are going into the private sector, know that City Year was founded by the private sector and has been, is still our largest donor and has been built by incredibly idealistic people who are using the skills that you're all learning and they're experiencing and marrying the values and impacts of their corporations and their brands to our work. And you can do that not just with City Year, but in all kinds of organizations. So I would say that if you're going to the private sector, look for public-private partnerships that are well aligned with your brand, with the values of your company. I think companies are, are realizing that people that work in there, they don't want to leave their values at the door. Their customers don't want to leave their values at the store, the front either. They want to be able to act on those values when they purchase things and, when, and where they work. And so all that builds loyalty and creativity. So I would look for ways to build all kinds of partnerships to serve on boards, which I know is important here at Fuqua and at Case, um, and to find ways to actually bring the sectors together. Because I do think the private sector is in a really unique position in society within the tri-sector of government, business, and nonprofits to actually play a leadership role because both sectors, the nonprofit and the government sector, respect that private sector brokering role and can really be a convener for ideas that move society forward. So I think we are out of time with questions. Sorry to cut you off, um, but I know that Michael and myself and David will be sticking around for a few minutes if, if anyone wants to come up and chat. So I'm sure that you are all just as inspired as I am to go out to pursue our passions, to do things that change the world, and to serve in each of our own ways. Please join me in thanking Michael Thank Brown you. for being here Thanks, and Anna. being with us. Today. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.